Okay, this is a walkthrough of the first assignment for Introduction to Data Science, and here we'll be using Python to process some Twitter data. So the first thing to do is to go down to the link where you can get the class virtual machine and make sure you have that if you're going to use it, or to make sure you've installed uh, Python if you are not using the virtual machine. Okay, and I encourage you to read this material about the assignment and about Python, especially if you're new to Python, uh, but I'm going to scroll right down to problem zero. And so some of these steps, problem zero included, should be pretty straightforward for you if you've used Python, uh, especially if you've used it extensively. Uh, but there'll be some steps in this assignment that should still give you a challenge. And if you're new to Python, this is a great way to get warmed up. So I've opened the virtual machine here, and there were a couple of things I had to confirm uh, to allow VMware to convert it to the VMware format, but it wasn't too hard. You can also use VirtualBox, which some folks have had. Have done. Okay. So here I am in the home directory, and there's some things that have been automatically exported by VMware from the host machine. You can ignore those, but we have this data side course materials directory, and I'm going to go in to that. And the first thing to do every time you start an assignment is to do a git pull. Make sure you have all the most recent changes to the assignment. This allows us to fix bugs at the last minute and not have to worry about how to get you those changes. Okay, so I'm already up to date, so I can just get started. We can look at what's in. Uh, I'm going to go to assignment one, which is what this assignment is. And I'm going to scroll down to problem zero and see what it asks me to do. Okay, so the first thing here is to, we're going to access some tweets through the public API that doesn't require any authentication. So this is pretty much identical to just going to the tw Twitter website and typing in a search term, in this case, Microsoft, and I'm going to do that programmatically by copying this little snippet in. Okay, so we're going to need a text editor for this, and uh, I, I typically wouldn't use a GUI text editor, but I'm going to in this case. I think it might be the most democratic approach, and this text editor called gedit is already installed, so that's what I'm using here. So I've just pasted this in. Uh, you may or may not be able to paste into a virtual machine uh, without some configuration. I've done that configuration, uh, which amounts to, for VMware, amounts to installing VMware tools. I'm not going to go into that here, but hopefully you can do that. If not, then you can type it in and it shouldn't be too hard. That's really the only thing you're going to have to be able to copy and paste. The rest will be typing anyway. Okay, so I'm going to save that and go into assignment one and name it print.py. And now I'm going to go back over to the terminal window and I'm going to run it. Now, I, I'm, I'm choosing to not use a Python ID uh, development environment. You certainly can if you want. I typically use this kind of a mechanism for a variety of reasons. One is just because it's a little bit more portable when I find myself in an environment that I don't have a lot of control over or that I didn't configure. Once I get sort of hooked on a, on a development environment, it becomes awkward to not use it. So I sort of prefer to just not be hooked on any of them. But if you have one you like, by all means, use it. Okay, so there I just ran print.py, and I see a bunch of junk on the screen. So let's go back to the code and see if we can understand what this junk is. So what this line is doing, this is a response from the website, which is very simple, just a one-liner to open the URL and get the whatever the website sends back to us as a string. And then this library parses that string uh, because it under, because it, you know, we're, we're asserting that this is in a format called JSON, and this JSON library knows how to understand that. And so what we get back is a Python object that has all this complicated structure in it. Okay. So all this complicated structure was there in the string, and now we parse into a Python complicated object. So what kind of complicated object? Uh, so let's say I response, and we can check the type of pi response to understand what we're looking at and print that out. And it says it's a dict. Okay, so a dict maps keys to values and to access the keys in the dict we can use a method called keys. And I'll do that now. And so this object appears to represent a page of results. There's sort of a page thing that might be the page number. Uh, there's uh, indicator of the next page and so on, but what the, the original query you sent 
Uh, and in fact, I'm actually some, somewhat guessing on some of the meaning of some of these. You can read the Twitter API documentation to try to sort this out, or you can just manually inspect it. But this results key sounds intriguing. So let's take a look at that. So how do we actually access the value for a particular key? We use the square bracket. Oops, excuse me. We use the square bracket notation and pass the key name as a string. And in Python, you can use double quotes or single quotes interchangeably. And so I've used double quotes here. So let's print that guy out. All right, so there's more junk. So the results is some complicated data structures. So let's do our standard trick here and see if we can understand what what that is. So I'm going to check the type of this thing. And I'm going to comment this out. And so comments you can use with a little hash character. And so that's a list. So what can we do with a list? Well, first thing I'm going to do is put it into another variable just to kind of keep myself sane. And so these are now the results. And I'm going to print out the first element of the list. And so here we're using the same square bracket notation, but instead of passing a key name, which is what dictionaries support, I'm passing an index number, which is what lists support. Okay. And you can look at the Python documentation. There's some links in the assignment to learn about the methods supported by both the dictionary and the list type. Okay. So now we printed this guy, and we, we get one element of the list, which itself looks like, yet, yet again, another complicated... Boy, that's going to get annoying. Another complicated object. And I have, you happen to be able to get a feel for this. You can recognize that this is the dictionary because of these curly braces. But we don't necessarily need to guess. We can just check it out once again. So what is the type of this list element? It's a dict. All right. Same thing. Let's look at the keys of it. And notice I'm not caring too much about a lot of software engineering here. We're just trying to inspect some data that we pulled from the web. And this is something that comes up quite a bit, I think, in these data science tasks, is you're looking at some data for the first time. And so it's not necessarily the time to get too obsessive about uh, software engineering, because there may, be, there may be no one that's going to look at this script besides you. You're just trying to get a feel for things. OK. So there I've printed out the keys for this dictionary. And I see some things I don't understand. But I would argue that perhaps text looks interesting. So let's take a look at the text of the tweet. We're presuming that this is a, indeed a, a tweet. And so now here, this is a little bit ugly. You know, I'm not saving the result as a variable. I'm just going to print out directly. But this is OK. This expression, let's see. So what the t what's the type of this expression? Well, that's a list. And we know with a list, we can access it with this square brackets and a number. So what's the type of this expression? Well, that's a dict. And we know that we can access those with these square brackets and a key name. And so the type of this expression is whatever's in text. And we haven't actually looked at that yet. But let's do that now. So that looks like a tweet. OK. And we can try out another one. And that's a different tweet. And if we want to lo loop over all tweets, we can do that too. We can say for i in, use this built-in range function. And now we can print out all the tweets from the first page, one, one per line, which is actually what the assignment asks for. Now, for this one, I'm not, don't bother turning anything in. That was just sort of a warm up, especially for folks who haven't really looked at Python before. But that's you know how you can kind of inspect a complicated data structure and try to make sense of it without doing too much work. OK. So now we're going to uh, get access to the actual 1% live stream. So this data was, again, just like going to the website and typing in a search term and looking at the results. But that's not a, we, we can't get a actual sample of, of all the tweets that are coming in. And so for that, you need to actually log in to your account and do a little bit of configuration. And the steps to do that configuration are here in the assignment. And we'll walk through that real quick right now. OK. So we go to, uh, by the way, here, if, you are, if you're not using the virtual machine, you will need to install the OAuth2 library. So make sure you notice that. OK. So if you first need to create a Twitter account, 
you don't already have one. Uh, and then once you do, you can navigate to this URL and you'll create a new application. I've got a couple here. Uh, you won't have those, and but you can create one with that button. Okay, so I'm going to name this, how about assignment one? I'm just going to name it walkthrough, but why don't we do something more like what you might do. And this is a data science assignment Twitter application. And so what you're doing here is registering an application that's going to consume this Twitter feed. Now we're just going to write a couple of scripts with it, but imagine you're, do, you're building some sort of a website that was going to do some analysis. Uh, they want to know about it and have a little bit of metadata about who you are and who you're authenticating as. So in case you do something strange, they can be aware, have a little more information about what you're doing with it. Okay, so here you can put in basically any URL, and this is again just a way to help provide some provenance in case you do something untoward. I'm just going to put in my uh, uh, homepage, and you can essentially put in anything. Okay. Actually, yeah, and just to be clear, it actually literally can be anything. It's not even going to be sort of validated. Okay, so fine. So here, and there's a, uh, an agreement here, and a captcha, and I'm going to agree to that. Type in this guy, and then create the application. Oops, that's already been taken, which makes sense. So why don't we say uh, data science It would have been a nice complicated name, and I don't care too much about it since we're not actually building an application with this. It's actually interesting. I didn't realize this had to be globally unique, unless I've already done one. Okay, so now we have some information and some credentials here, but there's one more step. We actually have to authorize this application to be able to use the Twitter data, and I'm not going to go into the details of OAuth here. It's somewhat complicated but necessarily so to sort of support all the requirements of trying to do to do web-based authentication so you can read about it if you're curious but I'm gonna just sort of blindly follow the instructions in this walkthrough okay so it's been created it gives me this little green message but it takes a second to come back so you're gonna sort of stare at this and nothing's gonna happen and I'm gonna refresh and there it is okay so don't be alarmed if it doesn't immediately come back it takes a second Okay, so now we have two sets of credentials here, this thing called a consumer key and a consumer secret, an access token and an access token secret. And we're just going to plug these in blindly to this file, twitterstream.py. And right at the top of this, you've got placeholders here where you can put these. So let me put those in. All right, so there's those, and now the rest of this file is not something you need to edit. This is just uh, manipulating the OAuth protocol to get the results. So I'm just going to save that guy and then run it. So Python, Twitter, string. And sure enough, I'm getting tweets from the website, and this will just run forever, constantly streaming down tweets, but we don't want to send it to the screen, we can't do anything with it, we would rather send it to a file. So I'm going to hit Control C to cancel the stream, and then I'm going to redirect this to an output file. And I happen to know that the format is again this JSON format, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and so I'm going to redirect it to that. So I'm going to hit return on that, and it'll sit there and silently blink at me forever. So I'm only going to leave it running for maybe a little while. What I've asked for in the assignment here is to let it run for 10 minutes or so, so you can get a fairly big data set. There's a step further down in the assignment that we require a reasonable size data set to really be meaningful 
um, and 10 minutes should be enough. And if you want to run it longer, you you can. In, the, in an early version of this assignment, I actually tried to ask people to run it for um, hours and hours and hours, but that's turned out to be a little bit unwieldy. So I did, I, I pulled back from from that. Okay, so that should be long enough. I'm going to hit Control C, and I'm going to look at what's going on here. So now I have a four megabyte file called output.json, and I can look at that file. The first 20 lines of that file with this command. And so that's what you're going to turn in for this assignment is the output of uh, head dot, the first 20 lines of the file. So I'm going to take the output of this command and put it into turnin.json, and you can turn that in on the Coursera website. And I'm not going to walk through that step in the interest of uh, time.